to Chicago Convocation 2017. Uh, Dr. Seabury Seminary is very pleased to welcome all of you here today uh, for this learning experience about bending toward justice. Uh, we have some really uh, amazing speakers who will teach us and inspire us today, I'm sure. Uh, we're all here because we're all still learning, right? Uh, so. Uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart and uh, Reverend Canon John Sloberg and an MDiv student from LSTC, from the Cormac Seminary, rather, Kenji Kuramatsu. Uh, but first, uh, we'll be hearing from our president, Roger Furlo, <coughs> who will tell us about what he's still learning. So, with that, I welcome President Roger Furlow. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't make up the title for this thing, so I, I had to um, figure out what to say. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I guess what I'll, I, I'll sum it up before I even begin is a kind of paradox, a paradox as to what I'm still learning. The more I know, the less I understand. That's the intellectual and the empirical but the converse is the theologian speaking. The less I understand, the more I know. Um, so let me just, I, I think the best way for me to do this today, it's an odd moment for me because two months from now, um, um, after 32 years of ministry, I'm retiring. And so those of you who are either contemplating retirement or, or you know, watch them contemplate retirement, know that it's kind of a, a very strange moment, um, especially in our culture. Um, which is so work-driven, um, that one thinks that their retirement um, really should be called something else, like restructuring. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the beginning of my restructuring, and I wanted to take the opportunity um, to share some reflections. And I wanted to have some help, and so I've been reading a lot of R.S. Thomas recently. R.S. Thomas is a wonderful Welsh poet um, who is an Anglican priest in Wales, a little more about the sort of paradox of being an Anglican priest in Wales, um, especially a town like him. Um, so, well, I, I've actually, uh, not all of us are good, uh, are experienced in sort of listening to poems, so I actually put copies out for you. Um, so if you'd like to follow, that would be great. But this is, this is um, what I'm still learning. Here's a poem called The Answer, which is great. I mean, it's well done. <coughs> not darkness. Twilight, in which even the best of minds must make its way now. And slowly the questions of sorrow, vague but formidable for all that. We pass our hands over their surface like blind men, feeling for the mechanism that will swing them aside, or yield, but only to reinforce and make new problems. And one does not even do that, but power is immovable before. Is there no way other than thought of answering this challenge? There is an anticipation of it to the point of dying. There is a time when, after long on my knees in a cold chancel, a stone has rolled from my mind. And I have looked in and seen the old questions fly folded and replaced by themselves, like a pile of grave clothes of love And really, that's where um, I'm still going. And I think you all are as well. Let me say a bit more about the poet. R.S. Thomas, as I said, was a Welsh priest, um, lived a very long time, almost throughout the entire 20th century. He was a fervent Welsh nationalist. So he was acutely aware of what it means to be a cultural outsider. And as a good Welshman, he felt he was subject to what he experienced as an alien and oppressive imperial culture, the Church of England. 
and he was a courageous religious thinker, not only in his political advocacy, as a man who felt still colonized after all these years, but he was also not afraid to make common cause as a theologian, to speak to theologians. Did did Thomas the Apostle, whom you heard about on the other Sunday, did he pray to the Thomas? Or for that matter, with the church father who prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So I'm enlisting R.S. Thomas' help in reflecting with you this morning, this, this afternoon, on what I guess I'd like to consider the three central themes of seminary life. Church, seminary itself, and by extension, the life of the mind. And finally, ordained ministry as the desire for church. Church, seminary, and ordained ministry. The future of all three of these seems bad. Bad. Especially when we think of it, think of them or experience church, seminary, and the life of the mind, and ordained ministry, when we experience them as up against a current nationalist, xenophobic, racist, anti-intellectual, polarized, and frightened American politics. We're in the midst of a racial, ethnic, political, religious, and cultural moment of religious crisis. And it's one that our panelists this afternoon want to take on the next few weeks in some exquisite and specific detail. So I'm not here to to steal your fight. So I want to ask you to indulge me in a more personal and perhaps a bit more detached, even old-fashioned kind of reflection on these three themes, church, seminary, and the life of the mind, and ordained ministry. As I say, I speak to you just a few weeks before retiring from this position, a surprise challenging. <laughs> But in the end, I hope rewarding here as president of this seminary federation. We have these two federated, I guess in American terms, ancient seminaries to the rest of the best we have. And after 32 years of ordained ministry. So I hope you don't mind my continuing to call it R.S. Thomas, priest and poet, to provide language perhaps more piercing and more eloquent than I can ever be. So here, first then. Church. I'm old, or at least feeling it. And so I'm now of two minds about church. About our church, and for that matter, institutional religion in general. I find myself, year after year, with increasing impatience with the church. With what I have seen so often to be a kind of self-centered and self-righteous churchiness that feeds the kind of marginalization that we all so often feel as faithful Christians. That's the one mind I have. But the other mind I have, particularly in these last days, is a real regard for and care for institutions, institutions, because this is a time when all of our institutions have been subjected to vicious politicized rhetoric. It's amazing, it's, I don't know if you read Ross Douthat, I mean, he's not my favorite guy, first guy, he's the Roman Catholic, the, the converted conservative young Roman Catholic columnist of the New York Times. And I grew up Roman Catholic and I know I was, I was a baptized Roman Catholic, and I know the difference between a baptized Roman Catholic and a converted Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Ross Dawson is definitely a converted Roman Catholic. But he wrote, a, I don't know if you saw this piece a couple of weeks ago. He wrote a piece um, recommending that, as he called them, liberals should consider going back to a mainline church. Because the mainline churches are actually doing what liberals complain is not being done. This is from Ross Douthat. Of course, who reads the New York Times anymore? <laughs> so 
So I, in some ways, I'm glad for that kind of institutional shout out from the sort of least expected places. So this sort of double-mindedness is something that I'm trying to resolve and I'm still learning to resolve. This real, real impatience, if not sometimes fury, with what the church does to itself. I've always, I've, I've often said, you know, the Episcopal Church, basically, it needs to get over itself. It needs to get over itself and move into something that really matters. On one hand, I don't want anyone to get over the Episcopal Church. I don't want any of us to get over the church as a whole. Because it's only a community in collective believers. So, I call on Aris Thomas to help me. He wrote this, he's got uh, about two poems. One of them is about one of my minds, and the other is the other. And the first one's called The Empty Tree. Uh, before I read it, the explanatory note, I think that the he that he's referring to is actually God in Christ. And I think the stone scrap of the open line, I think that that's one of the ancient village churches in the Welsh heartland. Uh, now, pretty much empty of parishioners. The, the, the British have this horrible word to use for those churches that are sort of past their time. They're called redundant. Redundant churches. As if any church could be redundant. So this poem's called The Empty Tree. They laid this stone scrap for him, enticing him with candles as though he would come like some huge moth out of the darkness to impeach him. Ah, he had burned himself before in the human flame and escaped, leaving the reason torn. He will not come any more to our lure. Why then do I kneel still, striking my prayers on a stone heart? Is it, I hope, one of them will ignite yet and throw on its illumined walls the shadow of someone greater than I can understand? Is it, I hope, one of that that, that will ignite yet, ignite yet and throw on its illumined walls the shadow of someone greater than I can understand? There's a book by Terry Eagleton, Eagleton uh, uh, another Roman Catholic, Turned atheist, turned Marxist, turned atheist believer. Terry Eagle is a very interesting character. <laughs> and he just published a book with a great title. It's called Hope Without Optimism. Hope Without Optimism. And that really sums up where I am with the church. Hope Without Optimism. And here's what hope looks like. Our poem, our, our Thomas' poem called The Kingdom. It's a long way off, but inside it, there are quite a few things going on. Festivals at which the poor man is kind and the consumptive is healed. Mirrors in which the blind look at themselves and, and love love at them back. An industry is for mending the bent bones and the minds fractured by life. It's a long way off, but to get there takes no time and admission is free. If you will purge yourself of desire and present yourself with your need only and the simple offering of your faith, need as a need. So that's church. My second theme, seminary. Seminary and the life of the mind. I guess, I think it's Mayor Emanuel who was credited with this statement, so it might have been Axelrod. Um, it was, you know, Never let a crisis go to waste. And the board, and many board members are here, the board of directors of Bexley Hall for the Wilson and Emeritus members know what that means. 2008 was a year of tremendous crisis um, um, for the Seabury West. Um, and it was, and I, as I joke with somebody, well, Bexley Hall didn't have a crisis in 2008. Bexley Hall has been a crisis since Philander Chase started the thing. <laughs> One after the other. Never let a crisis go to waste. With a committed board, with a loyal and committed faculty and staff, 
and with students and bishops who've been willing to take a chance, we sort of made something new. Um, and in the course of all that, and I spent my five years, as I say, were both challenging and I think in the end, wonderful. Um, the biggest disappointment, I think, was nostalgia or an outdated sense that the persistence of nostalgia, particularly among ordained people, who at one point I thought was nobody, <laughs> the persistence of nostalgia is one disappointment. And the other was the sort of growing, I'm not sure what the word is, but a growing distrust or disregard among bishops and commissions on ministry, even disdain in some places for accredited academic programs being created. It's a trend that I find to be very distressing, not just because I'm a seminary president, um, but because the life of the mind is what, in some ways, sets us apart as believers in this little corner of the kingdom. So, Many of you are familiar, not just with text and figuring, but with the ups and downs of all, several of all, Episcopal seminaries um, in recent years. Um, one in Boston, one in New York, but really all of them, in some ways, have had to deal with this tremendously changed theological landscape of the church. Um, so instead of talking about the Episcopal situation, let me say a little bit about the Lutheran situation, which is in some ways analogous to ours, and of course, Beckley Hall um, has had deep experience with Lutheran, and until recently, Seabury was embedding in sort of the Lutheran high headquarters on Hebrew Road. So our Lutherans are our friends, sort of, most of the time, <laughs> kind of. There's an article by Mark Ramquist, who is an ELCA pastor teaching at Luther Center, one of our friend centers um, in Minneapolis. He wrote this piece of, in a Lutheran journal. Um, and it was a kind of reflection on what's happening in Lutheran seminaries. And really, it's quite parallel to what's happening in ours. And I thought I'd sort of give you a little sense of what we're experiencing. He said, he said that, and I, obviously speaking now of Lutheran seminaries, but you can sort of do the math with Lutheran seminaries. I make the same point. That there were two streams of influence as these schools came to one another. One was a long tradition of university-based theological education long tradition of that. Um, and but for Lutherans, especially, a second stream, which he calls the product of the Lutheran pietistic tradition, that focused on faith formation and practical ministry care. So he saw this, you know, I mean, Lutherans are a kind of an image of the church. He saw this as right from the beginning, sort of separating two ways of understanding um, uh, theological education um, in, in, in Lutheran Christian schools. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of that, that long-standing division between the so-called academic and the so-called practical. He Grandquist argues that by the 1960s, the goal to combine these two streams, as he says, had been reached. So as he puts it, we would be forming pastors to be academically sound, spiritually wise, and practically ready for ministry. I like the word practically because it means people are <laughs> Forming pastors to be academically sound, spiritually wise, and practically ready for ministry. But then he goes on to say, which should be no surprise to anyone in this room, the ideal model in the 1960s anticipated a young man recently graduated from a liberal arts college, as he puts it, parentheses, preferably a Lutheran college, <laughs> who would then move on to the seminary campus lived there for two years of academic study, followed by an internship year in a parish somewhere, and then returned for a final year, add to that a quarter year of pastoral education in the political study. It would be modeled on a cohort um, kind of procedure so that you're always with the same folks moving through seminary. I know, John, you've got two of your classmates here in the room, at least. Um, and you know, they have a sense of, you have classmates as seminarians. Um, uh, you move through the process together, and you had pastoral and spiritual formation occurring in common activities on the seminary campus, and I love this part, 
led by the example of the faculty. <laughs> well, I've been around a long time. <laughs> and I lived on a residential campus for eight years. And boy, did we reverse that model uh, as faculty members. But there it is. That was the kind of the ideal. And I think that's the source of all this nostalgia, especially among clergy ordained about the time I was in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then Greg, um, um, Graham was presented on the stage. This was both an expansive and an expensive view of theological education. And if you put it, it ran headlong into a storm of stress. Inflation, deferred maintenance, second career family, fears for family, declining denominational contributions. And this is one difference between the Lutherans and us is that they, the Lutheran church actually gives money to their seminaries. Um, I hate to break it to you, the Episcopal Church has no obligation whatever to support a seminary, um, um, except a moral obligation. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that all was going on, and then the 90s and the 2000s hit, okay? Increased student debt as the cost of undergraduate education soared, particularly if you were still looking for, as it was now at this point, young men and young women, who would come with liberal arts education. Because it's the liberal arts degrees that became the most, most, most expensive then. Um, and it's, it, you, you add to that what the Lutherans know, and we know all too well, is the effects of church content. The effects of church content. That took me back to the first point about the Episcopal Church needing to get over itself. Uh, that that the, the sort of, the, in some ways, in some ways, how to put this, those who would like to dismiss us would in fact like to encourage us to keep fighting for each other because that sucked all of our energy. And then he also points out, not to mention, you should say, the significant decline in numbers of candidates for ordination. Because all you have to do is think of a 25-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 35-year-old sitting there looking at the church and saying, uh, do I want to Um, that's a Lutheran talking. Now that nothing to do with the Episcopal Church whatsoever. <laughs> nothing to do with the Episcopal Church. But obviously it's it's it all rings familiar. And if you now talk to Frank Yamada, who is the currently the president of the Formic, but is about to become the president of the um, Association of Theological Schools, this is the case in every denomination of faith. In every denomination of faith. These are the these are the pressures, these are the stresses, these are the these are but this is the crisis and now, the question is, can we turn the crisis into an opportunity? Which takes me back to my gratitude to our board and our faculty and our staff, where no good crisis could exist. So we have moved in ways that actually other seminaries are beginning to move to turn toward a reliance on partnership. We are no longer, as, as the Episcopal deans have been saying to each other, and trying to actually act like this, that we're no longer in competition with each other. Okay. And it's a return to really a 19th century model, 18th century model that precedes the academic and the pious discipline. And that's to say that, that theological education, formation for ministry, best happens um, in an academically infused contextual setting. Um, and um, um, of course, there's contextual learning, which, which means, as, as many of our students are now experiencing at Texas we do, that they are in teaching congregations. Um, and there is a kind of a, a kind of a compact between the congregation and the seminary and the student to create kind of mutual learning that we will learn from each other. And of course, you know, there are some differences. One is, you know, it, it assumes that there's some kind of theological coherence among our parishioners. And of course, that's not always the case, which is why we see this as a kind of a, the model for us has to be reciprocity, that we have as much to offer to, to, our, to our congregation and faith communities as we know that faith communities and congregations have to offer to us and to our students. Um, there's also, it's clear that, that we need and are beginning to re-emphasize the role of clergy as teachers, as teachers, particularly in this post-Christendom world, where, where people simply don't know what we're talking about. So the theological language um, has to be, um, completely rethought. Um, 
and, and, and revamp education. And also, we need to move clergy, people preparing for ordination or service in the church, as lay, whether it's lay or ordained, move, them, move us from the sort of administrator therapist model, which is the one I led in the center, um, to what I would call restoring the, the revenue. That, you know, can we imagine our clergy taking the same place in their faith communities as my friend the rabbi takes in his or her? Uh, their job is to theologize. Their job is to lead the spiritual life of the parish. And all this other stuff is the parish's responsibility. So that'd be a huge shift in the way we understand ordination and ministry. A willingness, I think, in the end, to embrace adaptive change rather than attempting to fix it. That would be the jargon of the Christian school. Um, which means to me that always have our eye towards God's mission in the world and not ours. So, our time is up. Love was part of this poem. Which, <laughs> which, it's all about choices. Which. And in the book I read, God is love. But lifting my head, I did not find it so. Shall I return to my book? And between print, wander an air heavy with the scent of this one word? Or not trust something, only the blows that life did me, blurring them like those red tokens with which we do I know that there were priests who talked like this. I think it would come as a great shock for many priests to have heard it like this. It would come as a great relief for many parishioners to be treated like this. <laughs> so there's my favorite, the listener in the poem. This, this, this is, this is um, I'd rather say this, this poem in, um, in honor of every introvert in the room. <laughs> Through every listener in the corner. Last night, the talk was of the relationship of the self to God. Tonight, of God to the self. Alone in the corner, one sits, whose silence persuades of the pointlessness of the discourse. He drinks at another fountain that builds itself equally from the dust of ruffian restraint. Outside, the wind howls. The stars that once were the illuminated city of the imagination to him, our fires extinguished before the eyes lent him form. The universe is a large place with more of darkness than light. But slowly, a web is spun there as mind vices string themselves to the night. If I could speak my truth so loud and loud, So I have to be frank with you at this time. Um, I feel more and more like the listener in the corner these days. Um, you know, retirement, restructuring, whatever you call it, it always calls for retrospection of some sort. I guess I'm now guilty of that as I stand before you. But I've always found the sort of churchy language of retrospection um, unappealing. Um, I hate it when pe church people talk about my journey, <laughs> <laughs> or my pilgrimage. Okay, no, why? That that that's much too organized. That's not. <laughs> um, but I do know that all of us need to, in some way, impose a storyline, a storyline on life's trail. We all do it, one way or the other, to impose a storyline on life's trail and on life's gifts. Because that's, actually, after all, what the gospel writers do. They impose a storyline on the chaos of that Christian life. Well, I was ordained in the early 1980s, so it was a very different story. Ed Brown, who remembers Ed Brown? <laughs> We're all old in this room. Uh, uh, Ed Browning was the presiding bishop. His church would have no outcasts. Um, it was an exciting time um, to be, for me to be a part of this church. Um, 
the purple can just the purple could just been had just been approved and women were being ordained and it was the beginnings of LGBT awareness. I actually there was there was a friend of mine who was a and she still is, and she's she's even older than I am. I mean <laughs> that was my community for life. And I had the great fortune in my ordination to be in, in all three parishes in which I was either an assistant or rector, all three of them had schools. And so I understood early on that the that the, the nature of, of of ordained life had to be committed to the shaping of the minds of those who dwell in the community as well as the state. So my, that, 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 that my favorite expression through all this time uh, is the title of that wonderful book by John Leclerc, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God. Not different things, but two aspects of the same thing. But I also was priest when my first rector during a real time of church tension. I was in Pittsburgh. And, and witnessed firsthand and participated in some ways in what, what really became this, this really ugly polarization of the Episcopal Church, one in which we're still trying to get part of. Um, so, so that was then, and this is now. Who was it? I was talking to the Dean of Erie the other day, and he said something about yeah, there was a second generation of priests who got all angry at us, the baby boomers. And now the post, I don't know, that, 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 that generation after them is now looking up to the baby boom and having some kind of wisdom. That is a scary thought. <laughs> that is scary. So I want to end with two poems and then maybe have a little bit of discussion. But actually one poem. And this, this poem is called The Priest. He had, a, he had to write a poem about the priest. So I, as I read this poem, I think of, you know, I think that in some ways his Welsh experience is so far removed from my American experience. On the other hand, what he's saying about the nature of ministry seems to me to ring true to both what I have been called to do, who I've been called to be, and what I've been called to ask to remain called to do. So I think that might be it. The priest. The priest picks his way through the parish. Eyes watch him from windows, from the bar, heart wanting him to come near. Women, this is long before women's organization, women pouring from the black kettle stir up the whirling tea grounds of their thoughts, offer him a dark filling of smiles and candles. I know who's going to kill a priest. <laughs> you know that. There's always an underneath. Priests, I love this line, priests have a long way to go. That is so true. A long way to go. The people wait for them to come to them over the broken glass of their vows, making them pay with their sweat coinage for their commitment. He goes up a green lane through growing birches, land cushioned with leaves. He comes slowly down in the dark, feeling the cross warped in his hand, handing on its thoughts icy. Crippled soul, Katie says, looking at him in a mind's heart, limping through life on his prayers. There are other people in the world sitting at table contented, though the broken body and the shed blood are not on the menu. When did he start it? I don't know. And I guess I'll end it in there. So thank you. I would like Your reflections on either the, what you remember and have seen in this 